Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I decided to start a series of videos real quick to help the brethren to answer attacks on absolute truth. Some of these things that we're going to be talking about can be used on a lot of subjects. It's not just limited to Christmas. Because Christmas, it's, this is December, it's the big time of the year. There's a big you know, fight going among the brethren. What's right and what's wrong? Well, number one, truth always divides. Truth always divides. So my first question before we get into this study, brothers and sisters of Christ, and anybody out there professing to be a brother or sister in Christ that watches this video, my first question I'd ask you is, do you have a love of the truth? Not just acknowledging the truth. I've seen brethren acknowledge the truth and then spit all over the truth. How they treat the truth. That shows how you love, if you have a love of the truth, how do you treat the absolute truth? I'm asking, do you have a love of the truth? Do you, do you just seek the truth with all your heart? Study, study, seek, seek, seek. Remember the Bereans. Paul comes and preaches truth to them, but they want to make sure it's truth. They want truth and they're seeking truth, so they search the scriptures night and day to see if those things are so. They want the truth. This is the King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English. Do you have a love of the absolute truth? Are you willing to fight for the truth? Okay. Lost, like I said, the lost world, they acknowledge truth left and right. But how do they treat that truth? And that's what's important. So, we're going to get into this series of studies. So please, uh, pause the video, pray, and say, Lord, am I seeking absolute truth? Or am I, you know, sacrificing absolute truth so I can have a little bit more of the world? You know, a little bit more of my flesh being in charge versus the Holy Spirit being in charge. So, please, pause and pray. Second thing I would ask is that if you haven't watched my studies on Christmas, or if you haven't watched my studies on Liberty, please go watch the studies. We're going to touch a little bit over it, but in my actual studies of Liberty, we really go over it hardcore. So what we're going to do in these series is, these are attacks that I get as a Christian for when I stand for absolute truth, when it comes to Christmas. Now with this subject, as you can read, if you can read, I hope you can see it. If not, this is just going to be a backdrop as I talk. But, because I can't tell how it's coming out in the video. But this could, the, there's so many things that, bre, that the lost world, false converts, and even brethren would try to sneak under liberty. It's not just about holidays. There's a lot more you can, and we're going to talk about that can come under liberty. But what's going to happen is we're going to talk about attacks that you're going to get when you stand for absolute truth. King James Bible. Okay? Now the first attack that we're going to be talking about today in this video is that when you tell somebody, hey, those pagan practices of Christmas, okay, the origins of the practice, the origins of the Christmas tree, the origins of the Christmas lights, the origins of uh, gift giving, like wrapping the gift, putting it under the tree, and then you have to wait till December 25th, a day that Jesus isn't born on, to open the gifts. Okay? Where does that come from? When you have someone that tells you, hey, that's unscriptural. Christmas dinner, what Christmas, you know, the foundation of what Christmas really is. Someone comes to you as a brother in Christ, like me, that sees that you're heading for destruction. You're inviting false gods into your house. You're inviting pagan practice into your house. You're allowing your flesh, you're allowing it to be about me, myself, and I, and you're allowing your flesh to get in charge. And it's not just with Christmas. If you see the word liberty, it's not just with Christmas. I've had people try to hide all kinds of things under liberty, all kinds of sin. I'll put it that way. They try to hide all kinds of sin under liberty. So one of the first attacks you're going to get and we're going to go through several of them, but we're, today we're going to talk about this attack. The first attack, when I tell somebody, hey, Christmas is wicked. It's sinful. It has no basis in Scripture. It doesn't elevate Jesus Christ. It elevates the flesh. It doesn't strengthen your walk with the Lord. It strengthens your walk with the world. And we've proven it. That's why I said pause the video, stop the video, go watch the Christmas studies. Okay? Same thing with uh, other things that they tried to hide under liberty, but they, first let's get to the attack. But the attack they'll get to you is, is why is my liberty uh, judged of another man's conscience? They'll take the scripture out of context. 
because they're PWCs. They're parroting what somebody else said. Okay. Why are you judging my liberty? We have liberty. Who are you to judge me of my liberty? That's one of the attacks you're going to get when you stand for absolute truth. And it's not just with Christmas. I've had this attack. People use this excuse when I call out their wicked, sinful video games. I've had people use this excuse when I call out their wicked um, Hollywood movies and TV shows. I've had people try to hide sin under liberty when it comes to getting drunk. They try to hide drinking under liberty knowing they have a problem with it and they get drunk all the time. I've had people try to hide a satanic style music under liberty. So one of the attacks you're going to get when you call out sin, specifically for this time period, Christmas, the sin of Christmas, or any sin, one of the attacks you're going to get for standing for absolute truth is you're going to get someone coming back saying, we have liberty. I don't know what you're talking about. I have liberty. Who are you to judge my liberty? I have liberty. And oftentimes, most brethren that I talk to when we get done with this and go through the scriptures, by the time I get done talking to them, they're like, wow, I don't know why I said that. I said that because I heard so-and-so preaching it. They're just parroting what somebody else said. Okay. So, we're going to get into this. Please watch my liberty studies. But you, they say we have liberty. There's two parts to liberty in the Bible, and we're going to go over both of them generally, but I have studies where we go over them hardcore. Okay. But when someone says we have liberty, there's two questions I'd ask them. The first question I'd ask them is this. When they say, when they come to you, brother and sister Christ, and say, we have liberty, we have liberty, the first thing I'd ask them is, say, is this. So you're saying it's a sin. You're admitting that Christmas is a sin. And some of you are probably like, well, what does that mean anything? Because liberty in the Bible, there's two types of liberty in the Bible. Liberty from the law of sin and death, and liberty from the Levitical laws. If he's saying that he's got liberty... And it's over here, the law of sin and death, and we're going to talk about it. He's saying that Christmas is a sin, but I'm not going to go to hell just because I celebrate Christmas. And you're not. You can't lose your salvation because of a sin issue. And we're going to talk about that. If they look at you and go, of course I'm not admitting that it's a sin, then what they're trying to say is that it's over here, under the Levitical laws. So then the second question you would ask them, is can you show me in the scriptures where God has commanded us to keep the birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day called Christmas with, along with all the pagan practices that you do. Can you show me in scripture where God defines how to keep it, when to keep it, where to keep it, who can keep it, and show me the consequences for keeping it. For, I'm sorry, for not keeping it. That's what holy days are. Under the, there's a lot more than just holy days. There's holy days, Sabbath days, new moon, uh, ordinances. There's a lot of things that fall under this. I just summed it all up to Levitical laws. Okay? So then you guys say, okay, then check. We go back to what I've always said, and what I was taught by some of the brethren that are now turning their back on this, chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. That's what you're asking them. Can you show me chapter and verse where Christmas is under the Levitical laws? as a holy day. Well, they don't like this. They don't like this. Well, let's go over the law of sin and death. Over here, the first question that you would ask them, are you admitting that, you're, that it's a sin and that you're sinning when you claim that you have liberty? Because the first ultimate liberty, remember, I'll, real quick, when you go to the studies, I show that liberty is being freed from the consequences of the law that's in place. And the reason a lot of the brethren fight this is because if they have to come to here for the standard, they have to come to here, and God's the one that sets the rules, the standards, what the laws are, you know, then they can't sneak something in. In other words, God's the final authority, they can't be the final authority. So they got to come in and try to mess up liberty, so they, and we'll talk about it, so they can add anything to liberty. It's not just these two, they can add anything to liberty. And we went through a list of a lot of things that people have tried to hit me with saying it's, it's liberty. We have liberty. We have liberty. If you're talking about sin and not being judgmental about salvation, but judging sin, 
It becomes a li that's another thing. It becomes a liberty issue if you're judging salvation. If I'm just judging sin, it's not a liberty issue. If I judge your salvation based off of a singular singular sin issue, then it becomes liberty. What's the law of sin and death? Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. This is when we hear about the law of sin and death. It reads, King James Bible, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and it was weak through the flesh, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh." that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Lib Remember it says, liberty which we have in Christ Jesus. I'm always getting ahead of myself in the Scriptures. The liberty comes because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It comes with salvation. That's what this liberty comes in. Your body, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but your body is severed from your soul. It's that spiritual circumcision made without hands. Okay? So now when your body sins, it doesn't taint the soul. Remember that I did a study once, I wanted to draw it, but I did a study once where I said body, soul, and spirit, and then I said God the Father, Jesus Christ, which is the body, God the Father is the soul, Jesus Christ is the body, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God. And I showed that we are not connected, I know it's not here, but we're not connected this, uh, our soul is not connected to this body. Our soul is connected to Jesus Christ, His body. And His body is perfect. So when this body of flesh sins, we're not going to hell. You don't lose salvation. It's not yours to lose. Our soul is connected to Jesus Christ. Our salvation belongs to Him. And that's what Paul's talking about in here. The law of sin and death. The lost world is still under the law of sin and death. Their body is still tainting their souls. They need the blood of Jesus Christ to wash those sins away and that spiritual circumcision, so no matter what sins they do as a saved sinner, it's not going to prevent them from going to hell. It's called eternal security. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15.54 If you want to turn there. 1 Corinthians 15.54 I hope I had the right address. But says, so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law of sin and death. But thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Now Paul talks about, we're not going to get into that one, but he talks about in a verse where he's going through explaining, I believe he's talking about his conversion. His life before he got saved, you know, what I, what I do I would, I would not, and what I would not do, that I do. And he's talking about his lost life because his, he's spiritually dead, remember he's not connected to the Holy Spirit, he's spiritually dead. The spirit that God has given him is just life support for his wicked body. And then after he gets saved, he says that with my mind I may serve the law of God. You're still under a law. I did that study once and it upset a lot of the easy believers. They, they want to be free from any law and be able to do whatever they want, whenever they want, and sin. And they, they love sin. They don't care. It's like, you're still under a law. He says, with the mind I might serve the law of God, that spiritual kingdom. But with the flesh, the law of sin. We're still under the law of sin. Someday, we're, gonna, we're only two-thirds redeemed, soul and spirit. This body of flesh is not redeemed. Someday we're going to get fully redeemed, which is going to be evidence, you know, a sign for the people, <laughs> for the Jewish people. There's going to be a sign that shows that, hey, Jesus is God. He overcame the law of sin and death. Uh, Galatians, turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. They don't like this. When they like to use liberty and try to hide fleshly, sinful, wicked things under liberty, 
They don't like when you call them out and say, okay, the law of sin and death, yes. Can you sin and not go to hell? Yes. But are you to sin? Remember what Paul said. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And we see here, he talks about it. Use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Oh, we have liberty. So you're telling me Christmas is a sin. Video games. Oh, we got liberty. You're telling me that liberty is a sin. I already know this. That's why I'm correcting you. I'm allowed to correct a brother in Christ on sin. I'm not saying you've lost your salvation. Some people have slipped up and went too far and said, hey, you've lost your salvation. You're not really saved because you're celebrating Christmas. You're not really saved because you're playing video games. You're not really saved, blah, 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 whatever else. All of the other sin that they see. They've gone a little too far. It becomes a liberty issue when they start judging your salvation off of this. Because if your sins, present tense, is a saved sinner, they're taking those sins and judging your salvation and saying you're, you've lost it or you never had it. That's when it becomes a sin, liberty issue over here. Law of sin and death. And here we see Paul talking about it. For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But love and serve one another. And that's what we're doing, brothers and sisters Christ. Those of us who stand for the King James Bible and absolute truth and say, hey, video games are sinful and wicked. You need to give it up. It's going to lead to your destruction. That sin you have in your life, all sin is negative. That Christmas, that pagan Christmas and those pagan practices you're doing, it's anti-Bible. It's anti-Scripture. You're leading head in destruction. We're doing it out of love. We're not doing it out of spite. We're not, you shouldn't be doing it out of spite. You shouldn't be doing it out of anger. You shouldn't be doing it out of bitterness. We're doing it because we love, but by love, serve one another. It's us serving one another. We hold each other accountable to this book. This is supposed to be your foundation in all matters of faith and practice. If you're doing a practice and say, I'm doing it unto the Lord, and yet you can't show in Scripture where that practice is, you've got a problem, a sin problem, a flesh problem. And that's where the brothers and sisters of Christ come in to hold each other accountable to keep us standing, keep us on the course. That walk with our Lord, keep our eyes on Jesus Christ like I always talked about. 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. It's talking about judgment on salvation. And I see that going around a lot among the brethren. The re I think the big reason why there's a lot of division and fighting going on is instead of treating it like a sin issue, they're treating it like a salvation issue. They're devouring one another because, like Paul said, as we get through here, he's going to talk about it. People are making it a salvation issue. It's a sin issue. Yes, correct your brother. Yes, tell him he needs to repent. Yes, he needs to get his heart right with the Lord and get back on the right path. But remember... If you're going to go around and it's, oh, you're lost, or you're lost, or you're lost, or you're lost, you're going to wind up devouring one another. The other thing is, is that you're not a car salesman. You preach the truth to them and say, hey, I've preached the truth. Hey, brother, what you're doing is wrong. They don't want to listen. Now God is going to deal with them. Lord, please open their eyes. And you give them to the Lord, and now the Lord will deal with them. And He has. I've seen Him deal with people. Starting with this person right here. You know, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed, you may not be consumed one of another. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So that's how we know, we're going to keep going, that the liberty he's talking about here is this liberty, the law of sin and death. Remember what he said before, that um, when you get saved, you walk after the Spirit. People who are Spiritually minded, walk after the Spirit, capital S Spirit, people in Romans chapter 8. And people that are carnally minded, walk after the flesh. He says here, walk in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to open this book and tell you how to live your life. This is your foundation. Not mankind. Not traditions of men. The Word of God. And it takes the Holy Spirit to open this book up. Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh loveth against the spirit. There's always a struggle going on. There's always a battle going on. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. 
But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Paul's saying, I know you struggle with the flesh. I struggle with the flesh. I fail the Lord sometimes. I'm still a sinner as a saved sinner. But if you have the Holy Spirit in you and you're doing your best to obey God's Word and to live a sin, you can't live a sinless life, but to, to avoid sin and hate sin, your attitude towards sin, you're not under the law. It's talking about the law of sin and death. Okay. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. This is how you know it's not talking about this over here yet. It's talking about this. It goes into the works of the flesh, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. That's what Christmas is. It's complete and total idolatry. I've seen people treat Christmas like it's crack cocaine. And you know, Pete, if you ever looked, people that are really addicted to crack cocaine, they'll stab their own mother in the back to get a fix. And what I mean by that is I've seen brethren stab other brethren in the back over Christmas. It's idolatry. Complete and total idolatry. Witchcraft. Hatred. Variance. Emulations. Wrath. Strife. Seditions. Heresies. I've seen people totally try to screw up liberty and the Word of God to justify their sin. And they start promoting heresies and teaching heresies. So we want envyings, murders, drunkenness. Remember what I said earlier? that I have, I've had people try to tell me that they have liberty when it comes to drinking. They won't go as far as to say drunkenness because the Bible clearly says drunkenness is wrong. But what they're really trying to do is, my drunkenness, I have liberty. And once again, here, if they're truly saved and born again, you're newly saved, and God's on the, in the process of getting that out, that drunkenness out of your life, you're absolutely right. You're not going to lose your salvation because you got drunk, if you're truly saved and born again. But here's the thing, God will get it out of your life. There is no, I've been saved 50 years, and I'm, I've been a drunkard for 50 years. No, you've been a false convert for 50 years. You're telling me God of the whole universe with the Holy Spirit that He sends and gives you that He can't get drunkenness out of your life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On one sin, no. I, I apologize. On one sin, you don't judge their salvation. But like I said, and, and it's usually not just drunkenness. Okay? He's been saved 50 years, and he's been drunk for 50 years. What else has he been doing? What's his attitude towards the book, the Word of God? There's a lot of key factors. We can judge whether someone's a false convert or not. But the part that Paul's talking about is when someone's struggling with sin, you see him struggling with sin, not justifying it, struggling with it. Why are you judging their salvation based off of a brother in Christ that God's working on? He's working on me. He's working on you. That's what Paul's talking about. But when you have someone who just flat out, I don't care, I love my sin, I don't care, I'm going to keep it. More than likely you're dealing with a false convert. Revelings and such like, of which I have told you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See, Paul's saying, yes, you've got liberty. Oh yes, you've got liberty. When you sin... You're not going to go to hell if you're truly saved and born again. If you sin, you're not going to go to hell. But what it will do is it will mess up your walk with the Lord. It will mess you up spiritually. All sin is negative. All sin will mess you up. It gets in the way of your Bible reading. You're praying. It gets in the way of your walk with the Lord. It will start getting in the way of how you treat the brethren. I've had brethren just up and disappear. Why? I believe they got back into sin and back into the world and it started affecting their walk with the Lord and now they really don't want to fellowship much because if they fellowship with me, I'm going to convict them of that sin. If they, they don't want to read the Bible that much anymore. Why? Because if they go back to reading the Bible through the Holy Spirit, it's going to convict them of those sins that they've fallen back into. Okay. But that kingdom of God he's talking about here is that spiritual kingdom, that spiritual fellowship that we have with our Lord and Savior and with each other. We're all the body of Christ. It's going to affect it. You can't inherit the kingdom of God. 
It'll, it'll start destroying everything. That's what sin does. It's destructive and it's all negative. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, capital S Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against, again, against such there is no law. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You're not under the law of sin and death. You've been liberated from the death. Death gets dropped. You're still under the law of sin, according to Paul, according to the Lord and His perfect written word. But we're not under the law of sin and death. You've been liberated from the death part. It gets erased. When you sin now as a Christian, and go, you're not going to go to hell and burn for all eternity. Such there is no law. Verse 25, and here it says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So you have someone come along. We have liberty. Are you admitting that Christmas is a sin? You're supposed to be crucifying the flesh with the affections and lusts. So you're admitting that it's a sin. Well then, if you're truly saved, you're right. I'm not judging your salvation. But I am judging that sin. It's going to affect your walk with the Lord. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's going to affect your fellowship with the brethren. And it has. We've seen it, brothers and sisters of Christ. We've seen it. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So Paul's saying, okay, you have liberty, but now we're supposed to be spiritually minded, Romans 8, spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We're no longer carnally minded, and the flesh is in charge, so we're walking after the flesh. We're supposed to be spiritually minded. If we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. In other words, it's not just talk, there's a walk. It's not just someone saying, I, I, I'm spiritual, or that I love God's Word and everything. Does your life reflect that you love God's Word? Are you living it? Verse 26, Let us not be desirous of fame, glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And when you have a brother or sister in Christ, say, hey, do you actually know the, the background to video games, what they're about? They're about they're addictive. They've got a lot of images, bad images and everything. They're, they're sin in almost every video game. When you look at the hidden, hidden meanings and stuff like that, there's almost sin in every video game, but it's, it's meant to be addictive. It's about pleasing your flesh. It gets your flesh riled up, and you stop pleasing God. And it pulls you away from the Lord, and it does. I, I'm, I'm one of many brethren that can say, I was addicted hardcore to video games. I fought the Lord on it, and I'll say it again because some brethren like to take, the, take my words and twist them. I fought the Lord when I was newly saved. I could have given up video games like that. Why did it take two years into being saved to finally get it out of my life? I was very addicted to it. It's so fleshly. You got someone who comes along and tells you that, what is your response? Oh, we have liberty, or who are you to judge me? Now you're the one doing the provoking. When it says provoke not one another, or envying one another. I'm not trying to provoke you. I'm trying to help you. When I come and say, hey, that Christmas, the holidays, if you look at the root, the foundation of the ho all the holidays and where they come from, the root cause and the holidays, it's, a big thing is love of money. It's one of the big things. But a lot of them have to do with elevating the flesh so the flesh gets worshipped. And oftentimes there's false gods that are involved. Whether openly or hidden, like interwoven into the holiday so you don't really think about it. But someone with the Holy Spirit is going to go, that don't look right. That Christmas tree doesn't look right. Um, Lord, can you show me where it's at in your birth? Oh, it's not in your birth? I have nothing to do with that. That just doesn't look right. And you do the history of the Christmas tree, it's an idol. That's completely an idol. There's no denying that it's an idol unless you're getting very prideful. You have the Holy Spirit in you, but you're getting so prideful that you don't care about the truth. Or you're lost. And you don't have that Holy Spirit in you telling you, hey, that's an idol. Drinking is wrong. 
and so on and so forth. Anything that they, all, any sin that they try to hide under liberty. Okay. Turn to Romans 6 1. This is the verse. Turn to Romans 6 1. I have to get this out. When they say liberty, we have liberty, and they try to attack you with their uh, and hide behind their liberty. You're judging me of my liberty. How dare you judge my liberty? First thing you ask them is this: Are you admitting that it's a sin? And if they, if I doubt they ever would, but if they actually said, "Well, yes," then you say, "I'm not judging your salvation, brother or sister in Christ. I'm just letting you know you have a sin issue, and it's going to lead to destruction." It's going to affect your walk with the Lord. It's going to affect your fellowship with the brethren. You need to get that sin out of your life. I'm not judging your salvation. Therefore, it's not a liberty issue. I'm judging your sin. Romans 6.1 we read, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him in baptism unto, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The kingdom of God, that spiritual fellowship, God's going to say, do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. And it's going to be backed 100% by His Word. There is no cloud, no haze. Well, I don't under, I, He's not really clear on that. It's backed 100% by His Word. We must walk in newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we should be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. It doesn't say that we don't sin anymore. It says that we don't serve sin. Our flesh isn't in charge anymore. The Holy Spirit has given us power to put the flesh down. That Christmas, it ain't worth it. You're letting your flesh get in charge again. You're trying to resurrect the old man. Now, like I said, people say, well, where's the proof? I've got Christmas studies proven that just from the few studies, I didn't have to do tons of studies, just from the few studies that I did, it was like, I ain't having anything to do with Christmas. Why? Because I have a love of God's Word, and this is my final authority in all matters of faith and practice. But we should not serve sin. Have I sinned? Yeah. Has my flesh tempted me, and I gave in a few times? Yeah. But as a whole, I don't serve sin. Okay? The flesh isn't in charge. The Holy Spirit is. And there's times where you can get so stubborn that you won't listen to the Holy Spirit, you keep uh, quenching the Holy Spirit. You qu I did a conscience study way back when, if you want to go look it up. I forgot the actual title of it, but we talked about conscience. We did a word study on conscience and stuff like that. You can quench your conscience. Your conscience will bear witness with the Holy Ghost in you because the laws of God are written on every man's heart. There's not one, I don't believe, one brother or sister in Christ out there where your conscience, if you're truly saved, Bared witness with the Holy Spirit and said, That pagan holiday that you're celebrating, it's wicked. You shouldn't be doing it. That something inside you just said, Something's not right with this. It doesn't line up with Scripture. It's all about fun. Look at the world. The world loves Christmas. They love celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. All these lost, hell-bound fakes and frauds, they love the birth of Jesus Christ as, far, as long as it applies to Christmas. The whole world as a whole loves Christmas. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Does anybody remember those verses? Or that verse? We no longer serve sin. You're spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. Not the other way around. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Liberty, the law of sin and death. Death gets dropped. You're not going to go to hell when you sin. But part of that being freed from the law of sin and death is also that your flesh is no longer in charge. Jesus Christ is. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Oh yes, He's my Lord and Savior. How, how goes your sanctification? Oh, how dare you judge me? Oh, blah, blah, blah. I thought you just said that Jesus Christ was your Lord and Savior. He commands you obey. He commands you obey. 
It's that simple when you get saved. Verse 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over Him. For in that He died, He died unto sin once on the cross. Remember the story. It is finished. But in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. Sorry, i got to turn the page. He liveth unto God, likewise. Why is it not? You have fifth. I have a lot of pages here. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Dead to sin, but alive through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should obey it to the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It seems like Paul's like still attacking sin. He understands you get saved, you've been liberated from the law of sin and death, but Paul's still attacking sin. Even though we can sin and go to hell, I mean, sorry, we can sin and we won't go to hell. We've gotten that part out. That's liberty. Are we supposed to sin? He's still attacking sin. Sin is still a bad thing, even in the life of a saved sinner. Hence the name saved sinner. For we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace. God, I say, what then? Shall we sin because we are under the law, but not, but under grace? We're not under the law, but we're under grace. We're not under the law of sin and death, but under grace. That's what a lot of people are trying to act like right now. They're trying to say that because I'm under the law, I'm, I'm sorry, that I'm not under the law, I'm under grace, therefore I can sin all I want. Paul's saying, uh, nice try there. Oftentimes it's a, you're dealing with a false, con, uh, false convert, but nice try there, but no. Sin is still negative. Sin needs to be attacked. It needs to be called out. People need to be correct, brethren need to be corrected when they're in sin. Okay. God forbid, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey? Whether of sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. Now that you're saved, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. He commands, you obey. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Were. Were the servants of sin. Past tense. There's a change. I've had someone recently try to attack the change life gospel. There's no change life gospel. We see it right here. That you were the servants of sin. There's a change in your life. Let's see, there's an old hymn. Let's see, what a change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Yeah. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. Okay, so I want to get this down. Like I said, I go way more in detail. We compare a lot more scripture with scripture when it comes to the law of sin and death. So brothers and sisters Christ, if they come to you and say, we have liberty, we have liberty, the first thing I'm going to start asking is, are you admitting that Christmas is a sin? Because that's the only way it would apply over here. And then the second thing I would ask him, a second question, follow-up question for this one, is that, am I judging your salvation or am I judging your sin? You're right. If I'm judging your salvation based off of one sin, then you have liberty. And I have no, I have no right to judge you of your liberty. But if I'm judging that sin, and I'm not judging your salvation... It doesn't apply here, period. I'm judging your sin, which I'm supposed to do as a brother in Christ. I judge my sin first. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. It starts with me, it goes to the brethren, and then you let the lost world know how much they're sinners to preach Jesus Christ to them. That's what we're supposed to do. Now let's talk about this one over here. Let's say we get over here and they say, and they say no, it's not a sin. Because most of the time they're going to say no, it's not a sin. So, if they're saying, no, it's not a sin, that doesn't apply over here. 
That's where we get over here, the Levitical laws. So then the question I'd ask is chapter and verse on the law, where God's commanded us to keep the birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day, put up a Christmas tree, put up Christmas lights, the gift giving, the Christmas dinners, and everything. Chapter and verse. That's what a Bible believer does. Chapter and verse. The Levitical laws. Turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Holy days, Sabbath days, new moon, ordinances, all that falls under here. Things that were unclean but now are clean. Things that you couldn't do in the Old Testament and the punishment was death or being uh, cut off, separated from the Jewish people. You're no longer considered a Jew and you've lost your inheritance. If we try to apply that today, it's saying that either for today, it's saying what people are trying to bring you back under the law, they're saying that you need to be killed or you lose your salvation. That's what it means to be cut off today. You lose your salvation. They're trying to bring you back under the laws to be saved, and it's no longer liberty. It's no longer what Jesus Christ did for you. It's what you're doing for yourself. And this is the, this is the one they mainly try to hide sin under. And when you say, okay, chapter and verse, where we're commanded not to do it, or we're commanded to do it, chapter and verse... They can't find it. They can't find it. Because it's not in there. This book right here, you listen, listen to how we read what Paul was talking about. This book attacks sin. Has a zero tolerance for sin. It says, hey, you're saved now. Law of sin and death is gone. The law of sin is still there. God knows you're still going to sin. But he still has a zero tolerance for sin in the life of a Christian. You still need to be giving up that sin. When you do fail the Lord, you need to be repenting, forsaking, and getting back to your walk with the Lord. God still has a zero tolerance for sin, even in the life of a Christian. That's why there's chastening of the Lord. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, when they try to take it from here, and we're moving over here. No, it's not a sin, okay? Then you ask them, chapter and verse. And they hate that. They hate it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stop there. Once again, the only time liberty comes in is when someone's trying to judge your salvation. Look what we just read there. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. He's made us free from the law of sin and death. And what they're doing over here is they're bringing in Levitical laws that God had put up in the Old Testament saying you've got to keep these or you lose your salvation you go back under the law of sin and death. That's what's going on here. Verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. His death is in vain. If it's something that you do, talking about the Levitical laws, in order to be saved, then Christ's death is, is, is pointless. Verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. And we're going to talk about circumcision here in a little bit. Verse 4, Christ has become of none effect unto you, Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who's coming around telling you and trying to bring you back under the laws, the Levitical laws, telling you you've got to keep these in order to be saved, salvation. In Romans 14, I know this is hard for some of you out there, but in Romans 14, when it talks about being judged, it's not talking about judging sin, because this book doesn't contradict. Paul tells us where to judge sin. It's not talking about judging false con. We're not allowed to judge false, con judge false converts. Yes, we are allowed to judge if there's someone's a false convert. Paul himself was judging and said there was false convert, false brethren. Was Okay. He even talks about, we're probably going to get into it, I think I had the verse where he says, I wish they were cut off. He's talking about false people, fake Christians. Not talking about death, and these people, are, I just wish they were dead. It's not what he's talking about. He's cut off means separated. Okay. 
So what's going on? When the judgment comes in, the judgment is salvation. And that's what the biggest fight seems to be going on among the brethren about Christmas. You have some people that are making it a salvation issue, and you've got brethren like me that are saying, hey, it's a sin issue. But God still has a zero... You're not going to go to hell for celebrating Christmas, but God still has a zero tolerance for sin. You need to get that sin out of your life. It's, heading, it's leading you to destruction. So you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? So you got people coming in and saying you got to keep the law in order to be saved. They're trying to spy out your liberty, which you have in Christ Jesus, and take the liberty away and bring you back under the law. And when you fail, they try to push you back over here. Law, sin, and death. You just lost your salvation. Now you got to get it back. Then you lose it again. Then you got to get it back. Then you got to. You see how that works? Who did hinder you? Verse 8, this, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. You didn't get that from God. You didn't get it from his word. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. When you got people coming in and trying to grab, bring you back under the laws, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It'll start hindering. Remember when we talked about the shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It'll start affecting you. When, you, when it gets to the point where they're trying to bring you back over here, it's going to start affecting your, work, uh, your walk with the Lord. A little leaven left the whole lump. Ten, I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whoever he be. God's going to take care of him. That's why when you have brethren, not brethren, some brethren have come to me, but we see all these false so-called Christian religions out there, false religions, it's all based off of this. you got to keep... They, oh, they believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ that's supposed to give them liberty, but they, don't, they say, but you got to keep certain laws and ordinances. And we're going to get into this. Sometimes they'll grab traditions of men that aren't even in the law. You won't find it in Scripture. A good example is the Babel buildings. I'm going to build a building, call that building a church, Invite both saved and lost to it. you got to wear your Sunday best. This is traditions of men, and they make it out like it's a Levitical law. And if you don't do it, you're either a very bad Christian, or you're not saved. Most of the time, they try to push over and get you to doubt your salvation, so you'll conform to the traditions of men. Or you'll conform to the law. Judgment, whoever should be. Verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Verse 12. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Now, how did Brother in Christ say that this is talking about death? Well, we might do another study on it later, but I'm telling you, when you actually study the word cut off, cut off just means separated. There has to be more to that sentence to say it's talking about death. In the Old Testament, it said that they were cut off by the waters from the earth from the earth, and it's talking about the flood. How God cut, killed those people in the flood. But there was more to the verse to say they weren't just cut off, they are cut off by water from the earth. Killed. But there's cut off in the Old Testament. You're cut off from, from the Jews. That soul shall be cut off. That soul shall be cut off. It's talking about separation. And what Paul's talking about here is separation. Just real quick, we'll go into it, just me talking a little bit. Please, bear with me, brothers of Christ. If we do this day, someday, praise the Lord. But what Paul's talking about, because he talks about before, we have false brethren. Okay? He's saying, I wish things were black and white, not gray. I wish things were hot or cold, not lukewarm. He wishes that there was people that when they say they're Christian, that they believe in Jesus Christ, it's guaranteed that's a Christian. And then you have people over here that flat out reject Jesus Christ. He wishes it was that simple. But it's not. There's so many false converts coming in that he's saying, I wish they were cut off from me. I wish there was no false converts. Remember what God said. His will is that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Paul's attitude is, is those people need to truly get saved and born again. But more than anything, I wish they weren't fakes and frauds. They weren't trying to put on a show and coming in and deceiving the brethren and messing the brethren up. 
And these last days, you know what my biggest struggle and fight with? A little bit of a tangent on the side. I struggle with fighting false brethren. I spend a lot of my time fighting false brethren and um, protecting truly saved brothers and sisters of Christ from false brethren and keeping people's eyes on Jesus Christ so that you're not one of those people that, that it's part of the falling away. That you don't faint, that you don't falter. You stand, you're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I try to witness for Jesus Christ. Today people really don't want Jesus Christ. Jesus has been, that name has been perverted. And they're deceived, and they, there's, there's so many different versions of Jesus Christ. Which one's the real? It's just so deceptive and so confusing to these people, to the world, the lost world. So I do try to preach the gospel, but it used to be you preach the gospel a lot, and you encourage the brethren to keep their eyes on Jesus, and you had to deal with some false converts here and there. But today it just seems like we're dealing with them hardcore, and they're taking up a lot of our time. We need to be careful to not let them take up too much of our time. But I am trying to warn you, brother, sister, Christ, be careful. No matter what group you try to get in, there's always going to be a false convert that tries to wiggle their way into that group. I have false converts that probably come in and say, Amen, brother Philip. Amen, brother Philip. See, I'm, I'm, I'm with him. And then he'll start, so, they'll start whispering things in your guys' ear. Well, I, I think he's great, but he's wrong here, 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 here. Can you prove that through Scripture? Oh, no, I can't prove it through Scripture. Just trust me. He's wrong here, here. Same goes for Brother Brian. Same thing goes for Brother JT. Um, Jacob Thomas. Same thing goes for Brother Brad Avenshine. Okay? you got people that are always going to come in and start, they'll act like, I'm on your side, and I'm with him, I'm with you. And they'll start whispering and start sowing seeds of destruction. Trying to pull you away from the Lord and wreck the kingdom of God. Your spiritual fellowship that you have with the Lord. And eventually it's going to affect each other. So that, just on a side note, cut off doesn't mean he wishes they were dead. He wishes they were separated from you. I wish false converts don't, didn't exist. I wish people weren't coming in pretending to be Christians and trying to get you back under the law and deceiving you. That's what's going on there. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 verse 1. Then fourteen years after I went up against, again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation, and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run, or had run, in vain. Three, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, see he's judging, because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, the liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that's freed us from the law of sin and death, they're coming in trying to spy it out. They're trying to get you back under the law so they can get you to think that you're back under this. You've lost your salvation that you might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. If someone's coming to you saying, you have to keep this and do this and do that in order to be saved, that's when you don't give them the time of day. That's when you tell them to get gone, be gone. Get thee behind me, Satan, like he told Peter. Get behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense in me. For thou savest the things that be of men and not the things that be of God. We have liberty. But when you have someone like me, brother, sister in Christ, that comes along and says, hey, what you're doing there is sin, this doesn't apply. It's not a liberty issue, it's a sin issue. And I'm saying what you're doing there is sinful and wicked. You need to get rid of it. Okay? So please, I, just, I didn't mean to go so long over this because I've got studies on it. Please go watch the studies. All right. Law, sin, and death. Levitical laws. So when someone says, okay, we have liberty and they're trying to justify sin. Right now it's the holiday of Christmas. Holiday. Man ordained. Flesh driven. Elevating the flesh. Unto the flesh. It's unto false gods. Uh, plural. It's not unto the Lord. So when I come and say what you're doing is sinful and wicked, none of this applies. 
I'm calling you out for your sin. And what they like to do is try to hide under this. Well, it's liberty. He's come out to spy out my liberty, which I have in Christ Jesus. Did I tell you you were lost because you celebrate Christmas? Did I tell you that you're lost because you play video games? Did I tell you you're lost because you still get drunk? No. I pointed out that sin. Now, what's your attitude towards that sin? That's a whole different story. What <laughs> did I say? It's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. So... One of the biggest things that I guess what confuses people here is this. Liberty comes around and someone comes on and tells you that you know what liberty is? Liberty means you have a choice. It's just a choice. We can choose. I'm talking about this over here, not this. But it's still over here. You can choose to sin, but you're not going to go to hell and burn for all eternity. But mainly they're using this over here. Well, what liberty really means is, is that we get to pick and choose. We can throw traditions of men under here. We can throw things under here that has nothing to do with the Levitical laws. And we can say that it has to do with liberty. And what liberty ultimately is, it just means you've got a choice. You can choose. You have a choice. And that's what Brother Brian and I, Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, that's where we separate. If you look at our liberty studies, it seems like we're right on. I know I've watched one of his liberty studies. It's like we're right on until we get to this point. He believes that liberty means we have a choice. You, have, you just choose. There's things we can agree to disagree on. It's a choice. That's what Brother Brian believes liberty is. And I've proven through the scriptures that that's not what liberty is. Liberty is being freed from the consequences of a law that's in place. Which means if you say that you can do it, you got to show me the law where it said that you had to do it or you couldn't do it. And now we have liberty and you can and we've been liberated from the consequences. And we're going to talk about some of those. But one of the biggest things that's the deception going on right now is that liberty means choice. You have a choice. You get to be the foundation, not God. You. That's very serious and it's very wrong. Okay. Let's go to the first command that God gave. See, what's different from the Old Testament to today? Well, the, uh, to the Old Testament, you didn't have a choice. But in the New Testament, because we have liberty, you have a choice. That's this big push that's going on. It's bringing God's authority, taking God's authority away and making you the authority. Uh, no. What was the first command God gave in the Bible that someone made a choice? Turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. There's the command. You can eat any, from any of the trees, except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then the day that you eat of it, here's the consequences. The day that you eat of it, uh, eateth thereof, thou shalt surely die. And spiritually they died. And then lambs or sheep had to be killed so, to, so God could make them close. Something had to die. There was a consequence. This is 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, Mary said, Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. In other words, you have a choice. And she did. You have a choice. And Satan prays on that. You can be the final authority. You have a choice. You can be a final authority. Do you really need to listen to what God said? Yea, hath God said, You shall eat of every tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the tree of the fruit, eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She added to scripture. She added scripture. Added to God's word. Where in the command did it say you couldn't touch it? That's an old thing. I always like bringing it up every time I read it. But she added to God's word. Kind of like people that try to say that liberty is just a choice. It's just a choice. They're adding to God's word. 
and you touch it, lest ye die. And the servant said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and, she sh and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he's telling her, you have a choice. Obey God, or become gods yourself. It's your, you become the authority. God's no longer the authority. You get to become the authority. Genesis 3, 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, something took control of her body and forced her to take the tree, food from the tree and eat it. No. Someone put a gun to her head. No. She's demon-possessed, and the demon's controlling her body and forcing her body to walk up there and eat the fruit. No. She chose she took of the fruit of the tree thereof and did eat. She chose to listen to the serpent, which deceived her, but she still chose to look at, listen to the serpent, serpent versus listening to God and obeying God's command. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. He wasn't forced to do it either. He chose. You mean choice was there in the Old Testament? Oh yeah. So then what's different today? If liberty is just choice, that we have a choice, and they say they didn't have a choice back then, but today we have a choice, that's a lie. They had a choice in the Old Testament. Remember 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9? I'll read the address, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. But the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God gave man free will. He gave man the ability to choose. Are you going to choose Jesus Christ? Or are you going to choose the world? Satan and the world. That's the only two choices. There's not a million choices. The world will have you deceived that there's a million choices you can have. No. Jesus Christ, His perfect written word. Or Satan and the world's way. He's given men free will. The right, he gave man the right to choose. And ever since Adam and Eve, men have been making some pretty bad choices. Some good ones, some great ones. You know, you got great stories in the Bible. King David, <coughs> he made some bad choices. But he also made some good ones. But, to really drive this home, here, if li liberty is just choice, you have the right to choose. There's things we can agree to disagree on. In other words, we are the final authority, not God's word. I've already debunked that. There's nothing when it comes to this book that we're supposed to be agreeing to disagree on. Nothing. The Bible says we're to strive together. We're to be of one mind, time and time again. One mind, one mind, one mind. All right. Let's go to... Let's look at the um, first one we're going to talk about is the Sabbath day. Okay, today, Sabbath day. You have a choice. That's what liberty is. Liberty is just simply, you have a choice. You can choose to keep it, or you can choose not to keep it. That's liberty. That's wrong. Why? Because you could always do that. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughters, nor I see, thy maidservants, nor thy ma manservants, nor thy maidservants, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within the gates. For in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them there is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That's the Sabbath day. Did you know that today you can still profane the Sabbath day? Oh yeah, I profane the Sabbath day a lot. And I'm not bragging like, yeah, look at me. I'm, I'm just saying, if you do work on Sabbath day, you've profaned the Sabbath day, period. You've broken the Sabbath day. Numbers 15.32, but we're being told that today we have a choice. That's what liberty is. You can choose to keep it, 
or you can choose not to keep it, that's liberty. No, it isn't. That's what Brother Brian and I, like I said, I'm trying to stick to the book. He's trying to go off this way. More than anything, I think it has to do with Christmas. If it wasn't for Christmas, Brother Brian and I would be 100% right in line together with liberty. But he wants Christmas to be under here, and it doesn't apply. He just can't apply it. Okay? I love my brother, but he's wrong. Mm -hmm. And this proves it. Numbers 15.32 And when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And that man said, I was demon-possessed. It wasn't me. I had no choice. I was forced to do it. I had no choice. No, he had a choice. And he exercised that choice. He just chose wrong. He chose it. His choice has consequences. Let's read about those consequences. Verse 33, And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in war because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. So what are you telling me? They had a choice in the Old Testament. How is that any different? Today we've got liberty. They didn't have liberty in the Old Testament. They didn't. But today we've got liberty. So what's the difference? Choice. And you sat there and you're like, they had a choice in the Old Testament, too. So once again, what's different? When liberty is applied to us today, if you profane the Sabbath day, you don't get stoned. If you profane the Sabbath day, you don't lose your salvation and fall back under the law of sin and death. The consequences... That's what liberty, true liberty is. Being freed from the consequences of a law, law of sin and death, or the Levitical laws, a law that's in place. So now, when you make the choice whether to keep it or not keep it, there's no consequences. Keeping it, there was no consequences to begin with. But when you make the choice not to keep the Sabbath day, not both sides, but when you choose to profane the Sabbath day, you're not going to lose your salvation. You're not going to go to hell and burn. But they were telling people that. You've got to keep the Sabbath day or you're not saved. You've got to keep the Sabbath day or you're going to lose your salvation. That's what's going on there. But is choice what liberty is? No. Liberty is being freed from the consequences of a law, a law that's in place. And you know what? A lot of people don't like that. You mean, I have to look up here and God's the final authority to say what's liberty and what's not? Absolutely. You can't just make something out of thin air and say, hey, this is liberty. I can play video games. It's liberty. I can celebrate holidays. Chapter and verse on the word holiday. One of the lies that you're going to get about holiday, holiday versus holy day is that they're the same thing. And by Brian's own admission, Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, I hate to keep using him as a bad example, but by his own admission, his actions say they're not, but his words say they are. You say, what are you talking about? Have you ever watched his study on Halloween? His audio study on Halloween? Or did you watch his study where, I can't remember if it was a separate study or he goes into it in another study, but he talks about um, Easter. Those are holidays. But they're not a holy day. And they're not something a Christian is supposed to have anything to do. His own words. So by his own actions and how he defends the word of God when it comes to Halloween and Easter, holidays and holy days are not the same thing. Holy day, God ordained unto the Lord. Holiday, man ordained unto the flesh. Unto false gods. So it's flesh, God, sometimes both. Okay. So I use that as an example. It's not a choice. That just defeated anybody that teaches that liberty is just a choice. It's just a choice. You get to choose. It's just a choice when it comes over here. No, it doesn't. 
Because in the Old Testament, you had a choice. That guy that picked up sticks on the Sabbath day had a choice. Our God is a righteous God. A righteous judge. Anybody that stands before Jesus Christ at the great white throne deserves to be there because they had a choice and they made it. There is no blaming anything or anyone but themselves. And the same goes for you too, brothers and sisters in Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, not at the great white throne, but at the judgment seat of Christ. When you see your works get burnt up and you have to answer for certain things in your life as a Christian, you only have yourself to blame. You had choices to make and you made them. Now God can forgive you, absolutely. But if you've got sin in your life and you've made mistakes and you die or the catch away of the body of Christ happens, you're going to be standing there before Jesus and you're going to have to answer for him. Oh yeah. That's why I'm saying repent. Get this sin out of your life. Live for the Lord every day. Don't fall for the tra trap of a pagan holiday that they try to put a rubber Jesus stamp on it and try to make it Christian. Don't fall for the trap of them putting a rubber Jesus stamp on anything, satanic style music, anything, trying to make it Christian when you know it's not right. How about the Passover? Under here. Now, like I said, they'll try to tell you you've got to keep the Sabbath day in order to be saved. If you don't, you lose your salvation. You fall back over here under the law of sin and death. They've come to spy out your liberty. But if I come to tell you that, hey, that, that pagan satanic holiday that you're doing, it's, it's not a holy day. Why are you doing that as a Christian? It's not unto the Lord. It's unto Satan. You're supposed to be doing things unto the Lord. Not unto Satan. But we get the Passover. Let's look about the Passover. Leviticus 23, another holy day. Or, you have the Sabbath days, but here's the first holy day we're talking about. Leviticus 23, verse 5. And the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. And the first day ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall not do servile work therein. Because when you have the Passover, then you have the days of unleavened bread, you're bound to go over a, a Sabbath day. But a holy day happens to land on that Sabbath day. So certain work can be done. I remember we talked about this in the study in the past. I did the definition, we looked in the Bible, and it's like servile means that certain work can be done, but only as it applies to that holy day. As long as it applies to accomplishing the Passover or the days of unleavened bread, you're allowed to do that work. But any other work is still not allowed to be done on uh, Sabbath days, even if the holy day falls on it. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. Work. Okay. And that work is to help them keep their eyes on Jesus Christ, the Lord, seven days. And the seventh day is in holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. That's what it means by servile. So here we have the Passover. And I didn't put the verse down, but we talked about it before. The Passover is talking about when God, the angel of death, but God passed over the Jewish people and smote the Egyptians and rescued them from Egypt. That's what the Passover is about. Once again, it's about what God has done. And God's the one that's commanding them to keep it in order to observe what God has done. Right. God's the one that's commanding it. What happens if you don't keep it? Or you profane it? Numbers chapter uh, Numbers th 9 chapter 9 verse 13 Numbers 9 verse 13 But the man that is clean and is not in a journey and forbeareth to keep the passover even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season that man shall bear his sins See cut off here isn't talking about death it's saying that you've lost you're no longer considered a Jew. That's why I was talking about when the Bible talks about in the Gospels where the Samaritans, the Jews, would have no dealings with the Samaritans. They'd rather deal with a Gentile dog over a Samaritan. And the more I'm looking into it, the more I'm realizing that a Samaritan in the Bible, that's actually a Jew that's been cut off. It's not talking about death. It's talking about they're not considered Jews anymore. 
they are not they don't get that inheritance. That's why you had Peter looking at Jesus talking to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. What's he doing talking to a Samaritan? We're not supposed to have any dealings with the Samaritans. They're cut off. They're Jews that are cut off. But today, if you tried to apply that to today, it's saying you lost your salvation. If you don't keep the Passover, you lose your salvation, go back under the law of sin and death. But once again, there's choice there. We know there's people that have profaned the Passover. we got the Samaritans. We know there's people that make choices, and they make wrong choices. They make choices that have consequences. But today, what does liberty mean today? It means that if you don't keep the Passover in the days of unleavened bread, and you don't do that sacrifice, which we don't do sacrifices, Jesus said it is finished, you're not going to lose your salvation and go back under the law of sin and death. That's what liberty is. Okay? I just got to keep running this home and really hammering this home and hammering this home. That's what liberty is. It's not a choice. Liberty doesn't mean, oh, you've got a choice and you can just choose. No, it means that you've been freed from the consequences of a law that's already in place. So for them to say, I have liberty about something... We say chapter and verse. Show us where the law is. Show us where the command is, you're not to do this. And you're telling me I'm not to do it. Show me the law that says you're supposed to do something, and now you have a choice, you don't have to do it. And there's no consequences. That when you make the choice to keep it or not keep it, there's no consequences. That's why we say chapter and verse, brothers and sisters of Christ, and that's why I'm trying to encourage you. Someone comes along and says, Christmas, I have liberty. Is it a sin? Are you admitting that it's a sin? Oh, no, yes, it is. Then it's still not liberty because I'm not judging your salvation. I'm judging your sin. Like I said, I don't think they'll ever say yes, but if for some reason they say yes, I'm not judging your salvation. I'm judging your sin. I'm judging you as a brother in Christ and correcting you with love. And telling you it's going to affect your walk with the Lord, the inheritance in the kingdom of God. It's going to affect your, your spiritual walk with the Lord. It's going to affect your fellowship with the brethren. I'm judging your sin, not your salvation. And if they try to bring it over here, you say chapter and verse. Where is it at in the scripture saying that you had to do it and there was consequences? Or don't do it, and if you did it, there's consequences. Sabbath day, you're not supposed to do work. The man did work, there was consequences. Today, there's no consequences. Leviticus chapter 12, verse 1. We'll just do one more, because this one isn't a holy day. This is one of the Levitical laws, okay? Ordinances. And we just read about them when we tried to define you know, Levitical laws. We read about what Paul said that they were trying to bring them back under here. But Leviticus chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of the foreskin shall be circumcised. And well, it's another side note, one of the old ordinances was if you touch something that was unclean, or there was a situation like this where you were unclean, it's because your body was connected to your soul. So when your body was unclean, it tainted your soul. Today, do we have that? No. We've been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, that spiritual circumcision. My body is connected to Jesus Christ. I mean, not body. My soul, forgive me. My soul is connected to Jesus Christ. My body cannot do anything to taint my soul. My body can get in the way of my fellowship with the Lord. My walk with the Lord, my body can get in the way of my fellowship with the brethren. It can truly mess me up as a Christian, but it cannot taint my soul to where I lose my salvation, which is not mine, it's the Lord's. Turn to Genesis chapter 17, verse 9. So here we hear about circumcision, and I want to throw it that when someone's born, they're supposed to get circumcised of the Jews. But Genesis 17, 9. This is where God starts talking to Abraham. And God said unto Abraham, 
Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and he shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And that's what's talking about being cut off. When you're cut off from the Jews, you don't, you're not part of that covenant anymore. You don't get those promises. You don't have an inheritance anymore. You're cut off. Verse 12, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generation. He that is born in the house, or bought with money of a stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your, your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Circumcision, Levitical law. If you didn't do it, you're cut off. You don't go to Abraham's bosom. You're cut off. You don't go to Abraham's bosom. Some of you, if you don't know what that, <laughs> that is, uh, you need to read the Bible a little bit more. Okay, Abraham's bosom, there's two places in hell. There's the fiery side of hell where you have lost people that are burning, and you have a chasm, and then you have Abraham's bosom. And in the Old Testament, people went down to Abraham's bosom that were saved, or not saved, covered, their sins were covered because they were doing their best to obey the laws. They weren't cut off. They weren't cut off or killed because they disobeyed God. Okay? They did their animal sacrifices, their sins were covered, they got to go down to Abraham's bosom. But being cut off means you don't go to Abraham's bosom. You go to the other side, hell. So today... Was there, is there people choosing not to get circumcised back then? Absolutely. Once again, we got Samaritans. Okay. They chose. There's people that choose to dis defy God. Okay. Um, I'm going through King David right now. You have Goliath. I defy the living God. You have people who choose to go against the Lord God Almighty. They had choice back then. So sitting there and saying that liberty just is it's a choice. It's a choice you can choose. That's not what liberty is. You could have always chose. What's the difference? In the Old Testament, there's consequences if you made the wrong choice. There's consequences. Today, there's no consequences. That's what liberty is. We're not going to lose our salvation. Liberty still always falls under salvation. Saying that if you do it now... You lose your salvation like you did in the Old Testament. No, you don't. And it's so important about trying to add choice. People are always trying to add choice, add choice. When you see judgment a lot of times, and we're going to go to turn to Romans chapter 14 verse 1. We're going to show you an example of someone slipping up and making a mistake and adding the word choice that's not there. Okay? They're always trying to throw choice in a lot. Okay? We have a choice. We've always had a choice. Sin against God or do what's right in His eyes? Do please God or please your flesh? We've always had a choice. But there's always been consequences to those choices. And today there are still some consequences. But as we're talking about this right here, there's no consequences. That's where liberty comes in. But Romans chapter 14 verse 1 we read, Him that is weak in the faith... Receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. When you use the word despise, it's talking about, I believe it's talking about judgment. Salvation. Despise. Why would you despise a... I, I, Paul, like I said, I wish they were cut off. Talking about false converts, despising false converts. Okay, when you have people that are lost, you try to reach them for the truth, and they're just so wicked and vile. You have some people that you know that are servants of Satan, and they're out there just destroying people, and they're just so vile and wicked, and you despise them. 
But here it's saying don't despise this portion. It's a brother in Christ. Don't be despising a brother in Christ. Okay? Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him with eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou to judge another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now stop. Where did you read the word choice in there? It's not in there at all. But you'll have some people that will grab that verse and say, You see, we have the right to choose. If you want to be a, a meat eater, you can be a meat eater. Or you can be a vegetarian. And we're not supposed to judge whether you're a vegetarian or a meat eater. That's not what's going on here. Let's read the word that, that God chose, not choice. It says, To him that is weak in the faith receive ye weak, but not to doubtful disputation. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. In other words, that person's weak. They don't have a choice. There isn't, I choose to be a vegetarian. He has to be. He's weak. And I remember talking about this in other studies, that oftentimes when it comes to herbs, eating herbs, you eat herbs when you're sick. I have herbs, and nowadays I've tried to grow some herbs, and you sprinkle it on meat, or you sprinkle it on this, you know. And we do use herbs with our regular cooking for a point, but you don't just flat out eat herbs hardcore. Well, you put it in soups and broths and stuff like that when you're sick, and you go to eat the soup, and it's like, because it's herbs, <laughs> you know. It's not like regular vegetables and stuff like that. I mean, herbs can be strong, have a strong taste. But you see what I'm saying? It's weak. And how do we know it's talking about somebody who is weak? Their body cannot handle the meat. They can't eat the meat. That's why it says here, And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. That's not fair. He gets to have a steak, and I can't. He gets to have a hamburger, and I can't. Your body, you, in other words, you're not supposed to be envious to the point of, uh, despising your brother because he can eat meat and you can't. Be very careful. That's what this is talking about here. Jump down to 14, Romans chapter 14, verse 14. We read, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. The guy cannot eat meat. His, to his body, that meat is poison. It's unclean. He can't eat it. He's weak. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably? If I know that that brother can't eat meat, there's a lot of times in people's life where they once ate meat, and now they can't. My daughter's one of them where she can eat certain meats, but there's a lot of types of meat that she can't eat now because her body cannot digest it properly. It'll stop her up and kill her. Okay? There's people that once could eat meat, and now they can't. So are you going to slap meat in front of them and tempt them into eating meat and killing them? Let's keep reading. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not just charitable? Destroy not him with thy meat. He can't eat the meat. If he eats the meat, it's going to hurt him or even kill him. Because he's weak. For whom Christ died. Destroy not him with the meat. For whom Christ died. It's talking about a brother in Christ. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Just because you can eat meat doesn't mean you have to eat meat. We always talked about it with the Jewish people. Just because I can have pork doesn't mean I slap a big pig on the table when I invite Jews over. How am I supposed to have a door, open door to witness to them if I've already offended them? Just because you can do it doesn't mean you have to do it or even that you should do it. There's times where you're going to have to make the choice that I shouldn't be doing this. Even though it's not a sin and I can do it, I shouldn't be doing this. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Remember what we read up there? It said in verse 4, it said, Yea, ye he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Remember what the Bible says? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Just because he can't eat meat doesn't mean God can't use him. 
You have brethren that have one arm. Uh, they're missing their legs. You've got brethren that are old, okay, that can't get around as much. God can still use them. He can still use you, brother and sister Christ, no matter what physical um, ailment you have or disability. The word we use today is disability. It doesn't matter. God can still use you. Okay. Why? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Your fellowship with the Lord is spiritual. Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you praying every day? It's spiritual. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Once again, notice how he keeps bringing up the Holy Ghost. And if, you keep, if you've read that passage, he also brings up the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Once again, when it comes to despising somebody that's supposed to be a brother in Christ, what you're saying is, I don't think they're saved. You're judging their salvation. Remember, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Whether he eats meat or he doesn't eat meat, that's not salvation. Okay? It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. See what I'm saying? People will take this verse and totally blow it out of proportion. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby your brother, thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. If I, I can't, I don't do it because I've had problems with it in the past, and so many brethren have had problems with it, I just stay away from it, period. But if I drink a glass of wine every now and then, because drinking a little glass of wine now and then is not a sin. Absolutely not. But if I have a brother or sister in Christ over, and I know they, they were once alcoholics, and they were very addicted to getting drunk, and God's helped them get clean of it, am I going to pop up a wine, pull out a wine bottle and set a glass there and start drinking wine right in front of them? Absolutely not. You don't cause thy brother to stumble. You don't offend him. Okay, you don't try to destroy him. Destroy his walk with the Lord. And what I mean by that is you tempt him and he gets back into it and he's falling back into getting drunk left and right. He just, he made that choice, I understand, but you take some responsibility also. God's going to hold you just as responsible. If you're causing a brother to stumble. 1 Corinthians, I think that's, I have it. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13, if you want to read that sometime. But 12, if you want to pause and read it, but verse 12 says, But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I'll eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. That's what it's talking about, brothers and sisters in Christ. You have someone who's weak and can't eat meat, and you have people that can eat meat. So he's saying to people that can't eat meat, don't despise your brother in Christ. Don't try to make it a salvation issue. God can still use him. Just because he can't eat meat doesn't mean he's not a Christian. He's still a brother in Christ. And that brother in Christ, don't you despise that man that can't eat meat. Right? Don't you try to make it a salvation issue. That's what this is talking about. And then you have someone come along and they read that and it clearly states that they're weak. And they'll come along and they'll try to insert the word choice. You have a choice. It's just a choice. And it's not. They've added to Scripture. Now, one last thing to put in here. And you've got to be careful, brothers and sisters of Christ. I'll reiterate it again. When someone says we have liberty and you're calling out their sin, and whether, whatever the sin it may be, sin of Christmas, sin of the holidays, sin of video games, sin of getting drunk, sin of uh, satanic style music, what, whatever, video games, 
and they say we have liberty, first thing you ask them is, so you're admitting that it's a sin? They'll never say it. Every once in a while you might get someone that says it. And I always say that. If they say, yes, it's a, they're admitting that it's a sin, then you tell them, it's still not a liberty issue. Because I'm not judging your salvation, I'm judging your sin. Over here. If they're, most of the time it's over here that they try to hide their sin. Over here. Then you tell them chapter and verse. Where's the command to play video games? And if I don't play them, there's a punishment. Where's the command saying not? Because they always say, where's the command saying not to play video games? Exactly! Show me in the scriptures where there's a command that says you're not to play video games and there's a punishment. And now it's okay, because you have liberty, now it's okay for you to play video games. It's not there. Once again, chapter and verse. When you try to hide it under liberty, it's got to be in the scriptures. This is our final authority. Now with video games and a lot of that stuff, it's not necessarily saying video games. It's what's in the video games that you can just grab verse after verse after verse showing that it's wickedness and sin. You can show the proof that video games are addictive. They're programmed and meant to be addictive and to pull you away and to waste your time. It's proven. But once again, it's got to be written down in here. Chapter and verse. There is no, it's not in there, therefore I'm the final authority. It'll be in here. Trust me. Sin, this thing, this book, God's perfect written word, King James Bible, kicks sin left and right. There is no deceiving God and getting up there and saying, I didn't know any better. Why didn't you put it in your book? And God will flip open the book and show you right exactly where you were wrong. See, I did tell you not to do this sin. I, see, Christmas, where did you tell me not to? You didn't say not to do Christmas. Flip it open. Idols. Idol worship. Pagan practices that have to do with idol worship. Flip over the Bible. You're supposed to be putting your flesh down, not elevating your flesh. Flip it over. Uh, be separate. You're not supposed to be conformed to the world. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You flip it open. The adulterers and adulteresses, know you not friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The world as a whole loves Christmas. Why are you acting like the world? Why are you being a friend of the world? On and on and on, there's tons of verses saying stay away from Christmas. And uh, pagan holidays like Christmas. Stay away from Halloween, stay away from Easter, so on and so forth. There is no excuse that's in the Bible. The Bible tells us how we're supposed to live our life for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be set apart from this world. We're supposed to be a light unto the world. We're not supposed to be turning that light off one time out of the year so we can act like the world and look like the world and indulge in the same things that the lost world does. Paganism. We're supposed to be a light unto the world. But one of the big mistakes, though, also, when it comes to liberty, I've already mentioned it a little bit, we're going to go over turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. One of the biggest things that they'll try to do is they'll try to grab traditions of men and throw it underneath Levitical laws. And it's not under Levitical laws. In other words, it's not in here. It's traditions of men. Okay? And liberty doesn't apply. They'll try to throw traditions of men under here and claim those traditions of men are backed by liberty. We have liberty. We have liberty. Okay? Colossians 2.1, when you make liberty out to be a choice, I had to put this down, when you make liberty out to be a choice, you know what you start doing? You start opening a door to allow traditions of men to be brought in. You do. Because it's not God sets the standard of what's liberty. It's not God says, okay, do this, here's the consequences, and now you've been liberated from those consequences, or don't do this, there's consequences, and he liberates us from those consequences. It's not God that sets the standards, it's you that sets the standards. And now you can bring in anything you want underneath there. And the biggest thing that keeps being brought under here is tra traditions of men. Colossians 2.1 For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea. And for as many as I have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. 
and whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. You know that's enticing to say the liberty is just a choice? It's just a choice. That's enticing. I get to be the final authority? Not the Lord. Not His Word. I get to be the final authority? Remember what he, uh, the, the serpent beguiled Eve. You get to be the final authority? It's enticing words. Oh, you know, I'm going to go over memories. And I'm going to try to use emotions and, and feelings and opinion. Enticing words. Don't let them beguile you with enticing words. What Stand firm, brothers and sisters in Christ. What saith the Scriptures? Your memories don't trump the Scriptures. Your feelings don't trump the Scriptures. Your opinions don't trump the Scriptures. Don't let them beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. There we see it again. When you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, you have liberty. But you're not supposed to use liberty as an occasion for the flesh. You need to walk in Him. Okay? Spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. Verse 7. Rooted up and built up in Him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And here it is, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. People will come in and start throwing traditions of men over here and trying to integrate it into Levitical laws when it's not the Levitical laws. It has nothing to do with the holy days. Like Christmas it has nothing to do with holy days. Christmas isn't a holy day. Holidays are not holy days, but they try to integrate them in traditions of men. Okay? Oh, you got to do this. You, uh, you got to build a building, call the building a church, and then invite both saved and lost to it, and they try to integrate it here and say, we have liberty. When it's traditions of men, chapter and verse 4 commanded to build a building, call the building a church, invite both saved and lost to it, and if you don't do it, there's a punishment. Then it doesn't apply under here. It's not about a choice. Okay. But when you start making liberty about a choice, you can really try to sneak anything in under here. And the biggest thing they try to sneak in is, is, is traditions of men. That's why it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They start bringing in traditions of men, and traditions of men start trumping what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross to give us liberty. You've got to start doing what we tell you to do if you want to be a good Christian. Chapter and verse. Oh, you... You just chapter and verse. That's all you do is chapter and verse, chapter and verse. Cha That's right. Amen. And I'm going to stick to it. To the day I die. Chapter and verse. And if you can't show me the chapter and verse, you're wrong. Period. So all you keep coming back with is feelings and opinions, feelings and opinions, feelings and opinions, and trying to spark emotional response from people. You're wrong. Period. Mark 7.13 says, Making the word of God of none effect by your traditions. When traditions come on in, they take away from the word of God. And it becomes tradition based. That's how perverted this whole system can get that God has set up when it comes to liberty. They can so pervert this over here where now anything can be put underneath there. Traditions of men, anything. I mean, think about it. How can you get video games under there? You can't. How can you get, get uh, trying to say it's okay to drink, trying to actually justify drunkenness? How can you hide that underneath there? Satanic style music. You can't. But if it's just a choice thing, then they can bring in traditions of men and hide traditions of men in here and say it's just the same thing. It's based off the choice. It's just choice. It's just choice. Be very, very careful, brothers and sisters of Christ. Same thing with holidays. I can actually see why people are confused with holidays versus holy days. Why? Because holy days is here. But what's the perversion side of holy day? 
The holy day itself isn't perverted. How do people pervert it? They make holidays. Now, I didn't mean to come that close to the camera, but I'm getting a little tired. We've been going for a while. I'm sorry for how long this has been. But that's how they, do, that's how they pervert holy days, by making their own holiday. A holiday is oftentimes, like I said, it's just paganism. And any holiday that seems Christian is they're trying to pervert a holy day and turn it into a holiday, a pagan day, and trying to get you to think it's still a holy day, it's Christian. Christmas, it's still Christian. Easter, well, we'll do Risen Sunday instead and try to do it on the, around the same time as Easter. We'll try to make up our own holiday on the, that's, we put a Jesus stamp on it and make it like Christmas. I mean, like a Christian holiday. When it, all it is is traditions of men. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm sorry this has been a while. I really wanted to get this out to you. It's not a choice. I just proved it. In the Old Testament, they've always had choice. What is liberty today? Okay, You've been liberated from a law, from the punishment of a law that's in place. They had a choice in the Old Testament. We have a choice in the New Testament. If they made a choice that had consequences in the Old Testament, today when you apply liberty, we don't have that consequence. The consequence isn't there. So that's number one to really just really try to drive home. I don't know how else I can say it. Right? Liberty is not a choice. And that's where Brother Brian and I, and I said Brother Brian, and I disagree. Right? And he has yet to show me in Scripture where we didn't have a choice in the Old Testament, even though I just showed you. And now today, with liberty, we, it's just a choice. There's more to liberty. There's a lot more. Okay? The law of sin and death, Levitical laws. Someone comes up to you one last time, and then we're done. Someone comes up to you, brother and sister Christ, and says, whatever sin they're trying to hide under liberty, but we're going to stick with Christmas because that's the time of year that this is coming out. This study is coming out. Christmas. We have liberty. You go to correct them on Christmas with love. You're correcting their sin. Don't get prideful. And don't fall into the trap of starting to be a, judging their salvation based off of one sin. Okay? But when you're trying to correct them of that sin of Christmas and saying, Hey, you're supposed to be elevating the Lord, not pagan gods. You're supposed to be elevating the Lord and doing things unto the Lord, not unto the flesh. Okay? When you go to do that and they come to you and say, we have liberty, who are you to judge me? We have liberty. Why are you trying to spy out my liberty which I have in Christ Jesus? Ask them. So you're telling me it's a sin? Is that what you're saying? Christmas is a sin. And they'll oftentimes say no. And that's what takes us over here. But let's say they say yes. And you say, well then liberty still doesn't apply because I'm not judging your salvation. I'm judging your sin which I'm supposed to do as a brother in Christ, which you're supposed to do for me as a brother or sister in Christ. Still doesn't apply. Nice try. Most of the time they're PWCing. They're pairing what some other preacher said when he tries to use liberty to justify sin or false convert, mostly a lot of false preachers out there. Okay, like I said, Brother Brian, I believe he's making a mess. He's, mess, he's messing this up when he makes it a choice. If they say no, I'm not admitting that it's a sin, that's when you come over here and you say chapter and verse. Chapter and verse where God commands us to keep the birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day. How to keep it, when to keep it, why to keep it. But most importantly, where's the consequence for not keeping the birth of Jesus Christ? So that today we have liberty and those consequences aren't there anymore. Chapter and verse. And, if they, and they'll just go crazy. If they have a love of the truth, maybe this will wake them up. And that's the whole point, brothers and sisters. The whole point of us correcting brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are falling for Christmas or any other sin that's out there is we're trying to get them back upright. We're trying to get them back on their feet to where they're standing again. We're not doing it to spit on them or to kick them when they're down. We're doing it to correct them and hopefully this wakes them up. Okay, so is Christmas a liberty issue? Absolutely not. And anybody that claims that Christmas is a liberty issue is making a mess of Scripture and not following the Scriptures. So grace and peace. i got to end this. I love you, my brother, sister in Christ. Whether you celebrate Christmas or not, if you're truly saved, born again, 
And I'm not making this a salvation issue. I always have to say that because there's a lot of false converts out there. Paul talked about being half messed with. I told you the number one thing that seems to be like the two biggest things that a when you get into full-time ministry, the two biggest things that you're having to fight is you're having to pr protect the brethren hardcore from false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, hirelings, and you're trying to push really hard for brethren to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ. Every day of your life, that you're walking your walk with the Lord, that's what's important. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. He can come back any day now. How's your life doing? How's your heart with the Lord? How's sanctification going on? How's your Bible studies going on? How's your Bible reading going? How's your prayer going? So on and so forth. We're always pushing hardcore, and that's the two biggest things that I'm doing lately in these last days. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, I don't know what tomorrow, or not tomorrow, I don't know what next year is going to bring. I hear all kinds of stories of bad things might be happening next year, or God might put off the bad things that people keep talking about might happen next year. He might put it off for another year. I've heard people talk about it year after year. This bad thing is going to happen. We're going to go through some hard times, and then God might put it off for another year and say, no, not yet. I don't want my, my, my children going through this. Or not yet. He not, might not want us to go through it at all, praise the Lord. Or... He might let us go through some of it, but he's not ready yet, and it might get put off. So I don't know what next year's got entail. I mean, I just I've heard stories that it's going to get bad. So you need to start cleaning up your life hardcore. Start living every day for Jesus Christ, and don't mess with liberty, as it is in the Bible. Don't mess with it. Leave it as it is. It has to do with the salvation issue. Judging someone's salvation when they sin, and the individual sin. And their attitude towards that sin, okay, if their attitude towards sin is I love sin, all sin, and there's tons of some sin problems and all kinds of, when things start building up, then you can err on the side of caution and go back and preach the gospel to them to either say, hey, it didn't take, or to remind them why they got saved. But an individual sin issue, you don't blame, it's all salvation. You're not judging their salvation. Levitical laws. The old laws where God has changed them and said, today, today, you have liberty. There's no punishment for not obeying those laws. Because some laws are still in effect. You're not supposed to drink blood. That law is still in effect. All Levitical laws and, um, was it, holy days, Sabbath days, new moon, and ordinances. All under the Levitical laws. Okay, there's some Levitical laws. You're not supposed to fornicate. You're not supposed to commit adultery. There's still some Levitical laws that are still in effect today. But the ones that you've been freed from, liberty, has to do with someone judging salvation based off of the laws that God has liberated us from, saying now there's no consequences. Right. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pray for me, brothers and sisters Christ. I'm praying for you guys every day. Pray for me every day. Okay, so I will see you in the next set of, in the next video that we do. So I got King David coming up. We are going to get to him. So some of you know what I'm talking about. Man, Bible man hunt. We're going to get to him. So I've got, it's just going to be a long one because there's so much to go through. So I'll catch you guys in the next video.